There we go. Well, tonight we're going to continue. Lesson two. Uh, last week was our introduction. Tonight is a lesson on God's revelation. And uh, just to give you kind of an idea of how we're going to tackle theology, uh, we're taking it by major theological areas or doctrines. And so the first area, I mentioned this last week, is called theology proper. And it's where we talk about the doctrine of God. And so this is the first lesson in that section. And with theology proper, we're going to spend four weeks. Uh, so tonight, we're going to talk about God's revelation. And uh, next week, well, actually in two weeks, next week we have a Holy Week. So in two weeks, we'll pick up and we'll talk about God's attributes according to the Word of God. What do we know about God that is He has revealed to us? And uh, it's a long list. It's a very interesting list. We're going to have a great time with that. Um, sometimes people are surprised by the things that God has revealed about himself. So that'll be a lot of fun. The week after that, we'll talk about the Trinity. Uh, a, a complex and controversial doctrine uh, that I believe is biblical, and I'll make a case for that. We'll talk about what it means and the limits on what we can understand there. So that's a, he that's a heavy study. It's going to be great, though. I'm excited about that. And then we'll finish up theology proper talking about God's decrees. And that's kind of a, a left turn not many people expect, but it's important to tackle this early. And there are things that God has decreed. He has made them so. And uh, the fact that he has made them so factors in to everything else that we will study after this. And so we'll spend some time getting to know that. So tonight we're going to talk about God's revelation. God's revelation is typically divided into two categories. The first category is special revelation. Special revelation. It's very special. It's so special, in fact, we're not going to talk about it at all tonight. Uh, in fact, we're not even going to talk about it in this entire section for the next four weeks. Special revelation involves those things uh, where God has specifically revealed himself to humanity in a very unique way, as opposed to this other area. That would be like the Bible, prophets, Jesus Christ, angels, visions, dreams, Urim and Thummim. I mean, there's so many ways that God has revealed himself to humanity that fall into this category we call special revelation. We're going to deal with that under the area of bibliology, because that's where most of it will fall. And that'll be in the section after theology proper. So theology proper and bibliology are the foundation for everything else. Um, so really these first eight lessons, everything builds on these. So that's a good foundation. So the second category is general revelation. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. General revelation. So what is <laughs> general revelation? Sometimes I put things on a slide just because I can. Okay? But it also lets you know where I'm going. All right? What is general revelation? Well, I've got a quote here uh, from James Leo Garrett. Uh, general revelation, and general in quotes, is that disclosure of God that is available to all human beings through the created universe, that is nature, and in the inner nature of human beings, conscience. And that's why I reacted so, so much to that song tonight, Great is Thy Faithfulness, because it talks about both of these, and we're going to talk about both of these, nature and the human conscience. So general revelation is exactly what it sounds like. It is general, so that in its, uh, in its reach, it reaches all people in all times, everywhere. So just to think about the difference between special and general, if you're a prophet in Israel and God speaks to you and then you speak to Israelites, people half a world away can't know that revelation, can they? Not unless the message is carried to them. That makes that special. General revelation means anywhere in the world at any time, anyone has access to the same self-revelation of God. And is accountable for it. So that's why we use the word general. It also means that anybody can use the same methodology and can arrive at the same conclusions, whether it's observation or a detailed analysis, it's available to everyone. 
Now, to examine this, I've given you on the, your handout, front and back, I've given you three arguments. And before we get into these arguments, and I'm going to give you a bonus one, by the way. There are actually many, many more. These are the most important ones. The first two, I think, are the most important because the Bible actually uses them as arguments. Now, I use the word argument very importantly. I want you to hear me. When I was going through college, there were many times I heard people refer to these as proofs. These are the proofs for God's existence, that we can look into nature, we can look at humanity, and we can prove that God exists. And these are some of the arguments that they would make, and they called them proofs. I don't call them proofs. They're not proofs. They're arguments. They're philosophical arguments. Now, why is that important? Because when you're sharing your faith with someone, one of these arguments may come up. Remember that it is just an argument and don't hang heaven and hell on it. Don't make it walk on all fours. Don't make it the be all and end all. If you don't agree with me on this argument, then, then you're a fool. They're just arguments. Now they're good. And they've been around a long, long time. In fact, I was trying to find some of them how far back they went. And they go back very far, very, very far. I, I think it's probably impossible to trace them all the way back to really know where some of these first came up. But um, they, they, they're pretty well established. The latter, the, the, the third one is going to be the weakest one. And I'll explain why. And then the fourth bonus one that I'll give you is one that is not really used in Scripture, but it's powerful as well. But again, it's just an argument, not a proof. So let's talk about the first one. The first one is called the cosmological argument. It's a great name for something you all know already. Okay? So you're going to learn something here that you already know, and you're just going to attach a big word to it now and makes you feel smart. All right? We call it the cosmological argument. The universe is an effect. Some of you already know where I'm going. That requires an adequate cause. Every effect needs a cause. This is the cosmological argument. Okay, so we'll keep going. It'll come back on. All right. Yep, that's fine. We'll turn the power back of the uh, projector here. That'll come back on in a minute. Well, I'll just read this quote. It's on your handout. Ryrie says. To say that the cosmos came from nothing means that it was self-created. This is a logical contradiction. Because for something to be self-created, it must exist and not exist at the same time in the same way. Furthermore, self-creation has never been scientifically demonstrated and observed. And he wrote that quite a number of years ago. And it's still true. It's still true. There has never been a spontaneous, uncaused moment of creation. Every, everything that is created has a cause. Now, let me talk about where... Uh, yeah, yes? I'm sorry, the, the AC may have reset. I'm not sure. No, it's, it's on. I got warm all of a sudden. I wonder if the temperature reset or... Nope. It, it just, it'll just catch up. <laughs> all right. Now... One of the things when you're going to talk about this with the cosmological argument, I want to tell you what you're going to run into. Because when we're talking about cause and effect, we would say the fact that the earth exists in effect means that it was caused. So there must be a causer, someone who caused the effect. Now, when you talk with people, the, the, the idea is to try to explain that away without God, without a an ultimate uncaused cause, the way people have tried to do that has varied over the years. If we go back to the 13th century, we, we see the initial seed of what became known as the steady state theory. And that existed, um, that existed for uh, up until about the midpoint of the 20th century. And it was replaced. But the steady state theory had this idea that the universe, at the center of the universe, matter was constantly being created. But at the edge of the universe, it was constantly decaying or being destroyed. 
so that the overall state of the universe, the density of the universe, remained the same. So the universe is expanding. That was an observed fact. And so we say, well, it's being created in the middle and it's dying at the, at the ends. Pretty much nobody believes that theory anymore among the scientific community. Fell out of favor, like I said, in the middle of the last century. And everybody knows what theory replaced that. They even named sitcoms after it now. The, the theory that came later was the Big Bang Theory. It actually originated earlier than that, but it became the dominant theory that still dominates today. So the Big Bang Theory says there was a beginning. In other words, this, this universe isn't just an eternal creation and a destruction at the edges, creation in the middle, destruction at the edges, steady state. Big Bang says there was a beginning and the universe continues to expand. Now, there's an obvious problem with that, and the scientists know it when you're coming at them and you say, yeah, but what was before that? Because oh, we have two problems with it. Don't we? What happened before the Big Bang and what caused the Big Bang? So lately, I mean, there's a lot of variations, and I don't want to try to de describe my, it would sound simplistic, but the most common one that I've read is a, a, an eternal cycle of bang and crunch. Big Bang... There's enough dark matter in the universe, the universe collapses on itself, and then the, what does that cause? It causes another big bang. And so we have to have an infinite regress, like going back eternally in time, of bang, crunch, bang, crunch, bang, crunch, bang, crunch, ad infinitum. Now, why do that why do scientists have those theories? Because that's what they observe in the universe? Not at all. They have those theories because they're trying to explain an uncaused effect an uncaused effect now before I go any farther then some people want to turn the tables on Christianity and say yeah but what caused God and we would say nothing caused God because God is not an effect he is eternal he is eternal he is not caused he did not have a beginning he is not an effect now that's a theological point that's not a scientific point. Okay, so that's kind of the cosmological argument. We do see that argument in Scripture. I, I think I read you this quote. We do see that argument in Scripture, in uh, Psalm 19 and in Romans 1. Let's take a look at Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. Now, this is not a proof of the cosmological argument. This is an appearance of of the cosmological argument in Psalm 19, which we studied earlier uh, last year. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Right there. That's the biggest aspect of it. The heavens declare. The heavens are, a, are an effect that declares the cause and gives glory to God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech night after night. They reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes a circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. So there's many aspects to this that the psalmist writes because on the one hand, he's appealing to what we see. On the other hand, what about the blind man? How would he know? Well, he feels the warmth from the sun. So there's this kind of multifaceted uh, observation of an effect that demands a glorious cause. And the psalmist says that cause is God. Paul does something similar in Romans. Romans 1. Let's just read 18 through 20. I've mentioned through verse 32, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Now, we're talking absent the special revelation. Why do we know that? Because, let me go back a second, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. All. 
So in other words, the wrath of God will be revealed to no, everyone, no matter where they live, no matter what time, no matter who they were. So therefore, what are they held accountable to? They're held accountable to what may be known. Why? Because, verse 19, because God made it plain. This is a reference to general revelation. God has made enough of himself knowable. Not for salvation. Hear me. You can't look out into nature and be saved. There's not enough revelation there. But you can look at the way the world works. You can look at the way the stars move and the planets move. And you can conclude that God is and that God is powerful that God is a God of order, you can, you can inclu conclude enough so that that response to God is a, is a response that God will, in turn, respond to. Verse 20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, and Paul mentions two, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. And this kind of stops. The cosmological argument is important because one of the common objections to faith is, well, what about that tribe in Africa that has never heard the gospel, never heard that God exists, and they worship the tree at the center of the village? Can, will God punish them? Will, is God angry at them? Is God going to judge them? The answer is, of course he is. Because God has revealed enough, even to that tribe in Africa, he's revealed enough to know that that tree did not make this world. Because they know that every other tree dies, and every tree can be burned down, and, and he can chop it down. And if, and if anybody's worshiping a tree, they're worshiping a, ma a part of creation and not the creator. So God says, the or Paul, God says through Paul, the people are without excuse. Now, the other verses that I'm not going to go into tonight are the reasons for his wrath. And that goes from verse 19 down to verse 32. Because an objection here might be, listen, why is God angry at all these people that don't even know him? Well, there's a reason. There's a reason. That's a sermon for another day. So if you want to know, just finish reading chapter 1 of Romans. Now, there are some limitations to this theory, and we need to know them, we need to identify them, and not shy away from them. That's why I call them arguments and not proofs. All right? The first limitation is that this uh, truth, this knowledge of God is accessible to all, but Paul says it's received by none. We just read this, verse 18. He says... God's going to judge them, but what did he say about them? He said, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Okay. <laughs> now, that's why, this, that's why these arguments are just arguments. They're not an effective remedy for the lost. And when I'm sharing my faith with someone, I do not start with the cosmological argument. I, far from it. I start with an introduction to what I was, what Christ did for me, and what I am now. The changed life is far more powerful. Because what happens is when people begin to look at nature, they tend to see what they want to see. Because we, by nature, suppress the truth in our own wickedness. Listen, we can travel a few miles over the hill here. Just head west, go a few miles. When it starts going down, there's a beautiful valley over there. And you look over in the valley, and there's this nice little development down there. Let me tell you, those people love nature. They love it. They worship it. You can get all kinds of granola and, eat, and practice all kinds of yoga and chant and hug on trees and do everything you want there with them. They love nature. And you think if somebody loved nature that much, they could see God through it. They could realize there is an all-powerful creator. But they miss the creator. Why? Because they suppress the truth in their own wickedness. So that's a, so. though the, the knowledge of God, his divine nature, and his incredible power, these are accessible to all. They are received by none. It's also 
partial in scope. So creation does not reveal much. Well, let me say this. Creation does not reveal anything about the love of God. Creation does not reveal anything about redemption. Creation does not reveal anything about the cross. And don't try to make it do that. I, I was reading an article one time, and I thought it was a reputable source, and somebody, no, you know, it was actually a transcript of a sermon preached by a pretty well-known pastor. And he went off on talking about some aspect of DNA and that it was shaped like a cross and all the stuff he did there. And he basically worked the cross into DNA and people were just wowed by that. I'm like, oh, oh, you can't find Jesus in your DNA. God made the DNA. DNA is amazing. It's a miracle. It's awesome. It's incredible. It's a wonderful testimony to his power and his creativity. But you cannot get saved looking at DNA. You need to, you need the word of God, the word of God about Jesus on the cross and why he was there to get saved. You can't get saved looking at DNA. And I'm not going to name him because other than that sermon, he's a great guy. All right. (laughs) All right. The second argument is called the teleological argument. And you know this one as well. Except I'm not teaching you anything. I'm just reminding you of stuff tonight. Now, teleological argument says a a universe with a design demands a designer. (laughs) Now, the most popular presentation of this uh, was in William Paley's Natural Theology, 1802. He came up with an illustration that peace pastors are still trying to pass off as their own you know he talked about finding a watch and the seeing all the complexity of the watch and assuming that it came to exist he said no the complexity the gears the movement the crystal the timepiece all you know everything how it all works demonstrates that there is a watchmaker it demands it and that's a great argument And so the teleological argument says we look at the order in this world. It demands, demands a creator, a designer to to make it so. That there's no system in the world that could exist without design. Now, in the last, um, what, 15, 20 years, They've come up with a a kind of a middle-of-the-road theory trying to appeal to this evolutionary crowd, yet still trying to hang on to some Christianity, and they call it intelligent design. Um, I don't don't know how I feel about all that. I think sometimes people need a bridge to the truth, uh, but I don't believe in an intelligent designer. I believe in God. Uh, He's not anonymous. (laughs) He signed his work. And, uh, and, and that's clear. So, But the argument, nonetheless, is that a, a universe with design demands a designer. And the Bible does use this uh, argument as well. We see it in Acts 14, 15 through 17. Notice this. Uh, now, wait a minute, let me just give you the context here before I read it. This was um, uh, Paul and Barnabas were in Lystra and the people were about to offer sacrifices to them because they were doing miracles. And so the people were about to worship them as God. And so Paul doesn't want people, he doesn't want to be worshipped as God. He takes great offense at that. And so Paul uses the teleological argument to appeal to their reason. Don't worship me. I'm not the one who made all this, all right? So what does he say? Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. So he appeals to the natural cycle. And say this is by design, and it's an act of love from God. 
and we didn't do it. <laughs> we didn't do it. I remember when I was um, you know, 15, I thought I could make it rain. Uh, yeah, I was pretty sure I, I could because I was working for my dad in construction. And I, I determined pretty early in life that I would it would never be... My, my dad had his own company, Lucas Construction. I was pretty sure it would never be Lucas and Son Construction because I was just not a... Construction is not my thing. I know I know how to do a lot of things, but I hate it. I recently did some plumbing work. Pretty sure I lost my salvation, my sanctification in the process of that. I just don't enjoy it one bit. Where was I going? Um, <laughs> I totally lost myself. Uh, oh, yeah, I could make it rain. Yeah, so I'm working for my dad, and we we're building. he's building a house in Colorado, and I'm, I'm his laborer, and I do whatever he tells me to do. And I would look up into the sky because because before the house got closed in, you know, if the rain came, the work stopped. Man, I could make it rain. I mean, I would do a little dance. I'd say some prayers before I even knew Jesus. I was talking to him. Bring the rain. Bring the rain. If you bring the rain, you know, I'll love you. You know, just. But it never. Yeah, it did rain. But um, unlike Paul and Barnabas, I might have taken credit for that but never in front of my dad, right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so this is, this is a real clear uh, example of that. But there are also, again, limitations. Uh, when you're arguing that the order, that the design demands a designer, there's a natural limitation. The first is uh, the place of evil and chaos in the world. Now, there is a theological response to that. Okay? How do I explain evil in this world? And if there and if God is such a great designer, how is you know, why is there evil in this world? There is a theological reason to that. Uh, an argument for that. However, it, once you're trying to make an argument for chaos, when your foundation of your argument was design, you're already losing the philosophical battle. So that's one of the limitations here. I'm not saying it's wrong. It is true. The design demands a designer. But for a skeptic, when they, as soon as they bring up this issue, it is an issue that we can address, but we're already backpedaling in the conversation to have to address it. Now, what's the answer? Well, God's will is the answer. God allowed for chaos in his design for a purpose. But that gets into other deeper theological issues. And if all we're trying to do is argue for the existence of God, this weakens the argument. The second limitation is that observation of design says little about the designer. We can make some conclusions about God's power, about order, but we can't conclude much more beyond that. So the argument is, again, limited. Now, our third argument is the weakest, and you're not going to find this in Scripture, but it is an argument that you'll find in reading, and you'll encounter it. And um, I'm going to tell you why I think it's one of the weakest and why I would not use it. And it's called the ontological argument. And uh, this argument goes back many, many centuries, and much smarter men and, and scholars have addressed this. And so my simplistic description of this, I don't want you to take, if, if this is something that interests you, you need to go back and read the originals. You need to go back and dig into this. But I'm going to give you a simplistic description of it, and then I'm going to beat down this straw man that I built, uh, just because I'm not a fan of this argument. But the argument basically goes like this. It is more perfect to exist than not to exist. Therefore, the most perfect being must exist. And the argument gets spread out in a, in a logical statement that begins with um, this idea that if there is a perfect being... The perfect being would be what we conceive of as God. And then consider that if the perfect being exists or if the perfect being doesn't exist, perfection is bound up in existing, not in not existing, 
therefore. And some people like that. I don't like it. It, it, it seems to stand on very little. The first limitation to me is that it relies on the assumption of that existence is a real predicate. In other words, of perfection. And I'm not sure that it is. Um, I, can I imagine the, a, a perfect example of something and that example not exist? Of course. Now, when you talk about being, that takes it into a whole different category, but it just feels limited to me. The second example is if we apply this, the second limitation is if we apply this to anything other than God, the argument strains credibility. And I will give you a real example here from Greek philosophy. This was one of the ones, my first introduction to Greek philosophy. My dad loved philosophy. He got a degree in philosophy. And um, so before we ever went to church and started reading the Bible, I grew up reading Plato, Socrates, or Socrates and Plato, and, uh, Aristotle and Emerson and Thoreau. And um, my favorite one, my favorite one, because I think it was probably the first one that I understood, it was an essay by Plato about Socrates, his teacher, called Mino. And Mino was a common slave. He was a kind of a dumb guy. Socrates was over here, you know, doing what Socrates does. He was teaching, and he, everybody's listening to him. And Socrates had this idea that all uh, learning, all learning was remembering because that this world is some sort of projection of another world. And so to, to learn something, the, the appearance of learning something is actually just remembering it because you already know it. And people were having a great day with uh, Socrates on this. They didn't buy it. And he said, well, I'll demonstrate. And so he grabs hold of this slave, uh, Mino. And through uh, his Socratic method where he asks questions and the person answers questions. That's where that came from, Socratic method. He demonstrates that Mino knows uh, more than a slave should know. Um, it would be like you know pulling up some kindergartner and demonstrating, this kindergartner knows the Pythagorean theorem. Of course you know that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. You already know that, right? Right. Okay, and he's going to demonstrate how the kid knows it. And um, this this idea then that if we apply this idea of perfection to anything, that's what Socrates did with Mino. And it doesn't work. Anybody can read it, whether you've read philosophy or not, and you see that, no, all that's happening is Socrates is loading the answer into Mino. And so the, his theory of recollection, his theory of remembering, is not a valid theory but he proves it using the ontological argument. And that's why I find it a weak argument. It doesn't work in any other thing. Why should it work when you're talking about the state of being, of existence? Because it doesn't work anywhere else. It falls apart. Um, and the Bible does not, to my knowledge, use that argument. Let me give you a bonus uh, before we go in, and we'll talk about here in just a moment what is revealed in general revelation. Before we do that, I want to throw a fourth argument out there, and I, I waffled on whether to include it in your notes, but it's the anthropological argument. And again, it's one that I'm not a real fan of, but you will encounter it. And I thought better of it, and I thought, let me just mention it. So the anthropological argument uh, for the existence of God focuses on the ideas, the great ideas that come out of humanity and insists that they cannot be explained by humanity. In other words, the ideas are so great, they must transcend us and therefore come from somewhere. Um, you could take the idea of beauty. Uh, how can you conceive of beauty? Well, there must be something that is innately beautiful. Holiness or righteousness, how can we conceive of that unless there is something that is righteous 
Otherwise, the word means nothing, right? And so we take any of the perfections that we can imagine and that they cannot be unless they exist. And they cannot exist without a perfect being. That's the anthropological argument in a sense. So how can a man be moral? What is morality and how can a man be moral? There must be a basis. There must be a, a foundation of morality. Yet, it's not man, is it? <laughs> I, can, I can demonstrably prove that. Mankind is not the foundation of his own morality. So, if I were to ask any of you, are you moral? You'd be hard-pressed to give an answer without the existence of God. You say, well, an atheist says he's moral. On what basis? On what basis? It's so funny because the only thing I've seen a response from the unbelieving crowd to the anthropological argument is they say, we'll, say, we'll take, for example, morality. The morality comes from the collective. We, we all just agree on what is moral. Yeah. <laughs> Look around. <laughs> there are people that have no qualms at all with things that I find deeply offensive. So the collective doesn't work for as a basis of morality. Because who's collective? Right? You go anywhere in the world, the collective changes. There are cultures that pride themselves on the fundamental issue of betrayal. That that's a virtue. And that's incomprehensible. So, so the anthropological argument looks at uh, looks at these perfections as uh, an argument for the existence of God. Okay, so what is revealed? Now we're going to do some theology here in our last uh, time. We want to do some theology. I'm going to ask you what is revealed in general revelation, and I want you guys to work up some answers, and we can do it all together. I was going to break you out into groups, but we're pretty small tonight. So let's take that first verse that we looked at tonight. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. What does general revelation reveal about God, according to the psalmist? Order. Order? Good. The, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. You look into the skies, you see order. Yeah. It's amazing how far back they've been tracking the motion of the stars and the planets, isn't it? I mean, it goes back. It says order's been around a long time. Yeah. What else? Predictability. Predictability. Okay. Power. His power in creating the universe. Absolute power. Yep. Yeah, the scope of it. Yeah. Because if it's everything in the creation, that's a pretty big scope. Yeah. How about his glory? The heavens declared the glory. Now, we can spend a long time trying to figure out what glory is, but it is something that the heavens reveal. And I think it has something to do with the scope of his power. All right, let's try another one. Yes? Interesting. Complexity. Complexity. Absolutely. That's part of order. Complexity, that's good. Romans 1.20. Oh, I'm sorry. I gave, you, I gave some answers here. Mine are the right ones. Yours are good. His glory, his power. You guys said these. I forgot that I put these in here. Okay, so we'll see if you can get mine. I won't say mine. All right, let's try verse Romans 120. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. What can we determine? Oh, I'll go back. Let me leave it up there. Undeniability. I like that. I used a different word for that same concept. I said his supremacy. We say his eternal power. Eternal is the superlative of power. He's undeniable in his power. 
There, there's no one that even close. If his power is eternal, no one else is his. So I like I like your word better, I think. But I put supremacy as kind of a Bible word. Undeni- undeniability. That's good. And the other one, right there. I, I picked up two here, the obvious two. His eternal power and divine nature. Now what does that mean? What is divine? I know divinity is that that candy, right? And they're a divinity, like a squishy candy. Yeah. Divine is of God. Divine it the opposite of divine is profane. <laughs> so of God. Not pedestrian, not of man, not ordinary. It's divine. So his divine nature, according to Paul, is a quality that has been clearly seen. I think it's because the most a man can do is climb a mountain. Can't make him. Let's try Acts 14. Yet, okay. Acts 14, 17. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. There's a word for this. I won't get ahead of us, but I don't want to go too long. It's a word for this, and it actually was George Washington's favorite word talking about spiritual things. That's the only hint I'll give you. George Washington very rarely said God. Providence. Yes. We can see his providential control of nature. He was a farmer, wasn't he? George Washington. He was a general later, but... He's a farmer. Farmers know a lot about providence. <laughs> you grew up in a, yeah, yeah. Farmers, yeah, waiting for that rain. Oof. Yeah, farmers know a lot about providence. It's an absolute surrender that I can't do anything to make it rain. The seasons are in God's hands. All right, let's try Matthew five forty-five. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So this is something we can all observe anywhere. Justice. Justice or... I'm going to say goodness. Because if we said justice, we'd say it wouldn't rain on the unrighteous. <laughs> you know, you imagine the guy at the edge of town, he's a bad guy, and the rain just kind of skirts around. <laughs> it's kind of like a tainus sometimes. We get, the whole country will get rain, and we'll be this little dry spell. Say so we're the unrighteous. No, it's goodness. And um, we call these, um, you know, universal blessings. In the sense that they're not limited to anyone, or not limited only to the righteous. They're indiscriminate, but they are blessings. All right, let's get two more. From, just from one passage of Scripture, Acts 17, 28, and 29. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Okay, so what do we learn about God? Now, just to clue us in, remember, nature, creation, was one aspect of general revelation. The other was humanity, this this conscience, this inner being that we have that we're all aware of, but none of us can point to and prove, this thing that inside of us. Okay? We are God's offspring so the fact that we have this awareness, the self-concept called a soul, the fact that we have this says something about the God that gave it to us. Might be a little stretch. I'll give you what I got. His intelligence. Why? Because we're intelligent. Animals have instinct. <laughs> Paul's looking, some of us are intelligent. Yeah, I know. know. Animals have instinct. Animals are not intelligent. They don't don't build computers. 
They, they don't aspire. They, they act on instinct. They don't have intelligence. I know your dog loves you. I'm not saying that. Okay, but, but he's never going to build a house for you. Okay? He's, uh, but God has given us something that is unique. When we say made in the image of God, our intelligence, our volition, our will, and I say his living existence. Why? Because we live. If I could rip off Descartes, I think, therefore, he must be. <laughs> okay. If I, if I can think, then the one who made me must really exist. Okay. Now, as we uh, wrap this up, now, what is the... Obviously, this is not a heavy theological topic in Scripture. It's a philosophical topic. Next week, we get into his attributes. That's going to come all out of Scripture. That is going to be stuff as the product of special revelation things we know about God because God has revealed them to us. But what's the value of general revelation? Well, for one, it displays God's grace. So we don't have to imagine that God is cruel and unfair because not everybody has had equal access to the truth. Everyone has had equal access to this truth. Now, what they do with it is their responsibility. How God responds, if they respond correctly, is his responsibility. But he's not unfair. So it displays God's grace. It also gives support for theism, the idea that God exists. Support. Again, I don't like to call these proofs. They're logical arguments. And they're, they're much deeper than I've presented tonight. Um, and it, you, know, you could spend years discussing them. But they do support the idea that God exists. The third thing that general revelation does is it does condemn it does condemn. Paul said that. It condemns because it is plain for everyone to see. So for one, if you think God is not fair because people don't have equal access, then you must really think God is not fair because he would condemn anyone on this planet. Well, everyone has been given some light in creation. We have enough in the world around us, every one of us, to conclude something about God, that he is. And so for those that reject, they stand condemned by their rejection because according to God, by his own word, there's he made it plain. He made it plain. I think we can demonstrate that. Go anywhere in the world. There's a concept of God. You know why there's a concept of God? Because <laughs> everybody looks at the world. Now what they do with that some have turned, okay, we recognize that I, I came from somewhere, and they turn and worship something they made with their own hands. That's on them, isn't it? But the very fact that they have that awareness, it's global. There's no natural, natural atheistic society. The only atheistic societies are where it's imposed on them. It's not something that occurs in nature. What occurs in nature is theism. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And that we're appreciative of your special revelation. We recognize that, Lord, even in your own creation, there's much we can observe about you. And, uh, Lord, we stand amazed at the glory and the power that created all that's around us. The sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, the jungle, the rivers, the rain that comes. Uh, Lord, it's just, uh, I'm awestruck by your creation. Uh, even today on our walk this morning, we just saw so many variety of birds. Uh, just, uh, Lord... If you'd willed it, they'd have sung your praises this morning because their their incredible variety and uh, intricate designs, all purposely made, uh, Lord, are just a testimony to your greatness, and we thank you for that, as are we. And we're thankful, Lord, for the intelligence that we have that comes from you and the ability to think and process. Lord, may we use this knowledge for your glory as we share your truth with those that don't yet know it. May we be your hands and feet in, sp in spreading that special revelation. For Jesus Christ, it's in his name we pray. Amen.